Greetings ladies and mental gents and welcome to my channel, where I like to make audio narrations of stories from across the internet. In this series, we'll be focusing on a web novel called There Is No Epic Lucha, Only Puns, from the website Royal Road. And in this video, we'll be doing chapters 56 to 58. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. There is no epic lucha, only puns, chapter 56, birds, mushrooms, and taxes. A boss room with no boss will like Delta with no mana or DP. Hopeful, in spirit, but as useful as a noisy wind. So, that's a B number 32 that has declined the job offer. Maybe I should ask the trees next. Delta muttered as a grateful red bee went back to the task of investing the flower for the queen. She was glad that Nui decided to wander off to do his own thing. Having his flat stare at her back as she kept asking for a monster to be a boss became a little hard to ignore. Delta knew that she could just create a monster to be the boss, give the new creature the task for life and let it be. Unfair. She had no doubt the monster would be gladly accept the offer, but the choice wasn't fair one. It was like a fresh newborn latching onto the task like a mother. It didn't know anything else to compare it to, even the rail and Venus knowledge being added to the creation pool for frogs. It didn't mean that the next frog monster would understand what it was accepting. To Delta, it was no better than straight up creating and chaining a monster to the room to make the job easier. The fact that the monster might never grow upset or might even be happy with the job for all of time wasn't even something she cared to think of. Their ignorance didn't excuse Delta's immoral choices on her own head. It really left Delta with a few options. One was to simply not have a boss. Delta discarded that idea immediately. She was optimistic with the visitors, but not idiotic. Groom only had to go so far because Sis left the door unlocked, but not something that would happen again. The other option was to look for alternatives and hope that one of them stuck as a boss. If a room eventually offered her a chance to spin the wheel to spawn a boss, Delta would turn it down. After Bob, it was just better for her to peace of mind not to gamble for a while. Bob was nice, but he still looked like something crawled out of the devil's basement and gave old Scratch a shock on the way out. Delta walked down the, into the river, whistling as she plotted, looking at her menu, and she could see 78 DFP and was cheerfully waiting for a chance to be spent. Her 84 mana was maxed out, and the boss room gave her that extra 5 mana limit. Honestly, she would have to make up many rooms as possible to get most out of the system. After digging her way into Remy's circus, Delta was just going to take things one step at a time. The river rushed overhead and Delta stretched as the slightly warm water flowed through her, tickling her body a little. More monsters, more rooms, more ideas. Easy enough. I cause enough trouble by accident. I'm sure I can rustle something up when I put my mind to it. Delta smiled to herself and then floated and let the water carry her downstream. Delta flew up and stood above the river for a moment, face focused as she pulled up the menu again. Waterfall, river, beehive, circus, hot spring, frog lair, entrance, empty boss room, and a resting area behind the waterfall. I have options. I just need them to tie them all together. The boss is going to be a key to this, Delta said aloud, and she paced back and forward as she let ideas flow through her. The room is big. It means to tire people out originally, and I can use it like that as well. But I can also use it another way. It makes people travel and search for things in a jungle. Maybe I could tie the boss, in a way, to the things in the jungle. I doubt that I can make a rule that would prevent anyone accessing the boss room without the right items. Not just now, anyway. But not everyone that will come to my dungeon will want to fight the boss. The other slowed as she latched onto some fault. A lot of people want to be resources, like Mrs. Damagost. She liked the plants, so... What if the boss could be passed if the person explored thoroughly enough and worked for the items in each area? A scavenger hunt. Delta tested the words and they seemed to strike something. Delta felt so pleased at her usually chaotic thought process that she decided to let it go wild. Can't kill the monsters for the parts, they have to be earned. Stop the usual glory hounds and grim like funk. Makes them spend more time on the floor, which means more items for me and more mana. 
So I need to make each area valuable and have a unique item held by each of the area's bosses. Delta almost felt like fist pumping as the dots just lined up in her head. I need a boss, she declared and then froze. Delta deflated and the original issue flashed back into her head. You look troubled. Delta screeched and almost toppled back onto the river as Davina's voice called from her from behind. Delta spun with a glare as the pleasantly calm Davina. You do that on purpose, she accused and Davina tilted her face. I have no idea what you mean, mother. I would never upset you, even if you did happen to create most evil creature. Davina replied, her calm tone changing. Delta blinked a response. I did? She replied slowly, in confusion, Davina's pace pinched around her eyes. The orange menace. Davina added a little too quickly, betraying her facade. The words made Delta perk up. Dull bird, she exclaimed with joy. Then, as if summoned, a flash of orange appeared. The bird in question chirped as it landed on Davina's head. Make it stop, Davina requested, and a strained voice that caused Delta to stare at her. Stop? She echoed and the bird preened. The frog woman closed her eyes. The bird is the most foul. The foulest! Dalbert chimed in, but Davina kept talking, as if she didn't even exist. The thing in this jungle, it refuses to leave me alone. Davina complained loudly. Delta had never seen the woman so unlike herself. I must like you. I mean, every wise person has a flying familiar of some kind. Even Merland has an owl. Delta reminded with a smile on her face. Davina nodded furiously. This Merlin sounds correct. I would like to trade this pet in for an owl, please, she requested, and Dilbert tilted his head. Get rid of me for an owl. Hoot, do you think you are? Dilbert demanded aloud, and this made Davina scream as she swatted at the bird, which flapped out of reach. Delta stuffed her fists into her mouth as she felt a gale of giggles rise up at their antics. It was then the rail pulled himself from the river, his lean body looking far more toned than Delta remembered from yesterday. I heard someone here. Greetings, mother. Hello, Dev. Rail smiled easily and the frozen Divina. Delta waited, but could only watch his rail move closer to Divina. Dalbo landed back on Divina's head with stared at rail. Don't you dare. Davina hissed and Dilbert hesitated at the threat, and then puffed out its chest in defiance. Hello! He greeted, and Rail's eyes seemed to sparkle with the sight of a turking bird. Davina, your bird talks like a person. Rail laughed as he crossed his thick arms. Dilbert narrowed his little beady eyes. Look, Davina, the frog skipped brain day. He fired back. Davina reached up and held the bird's beak shut tight with one hand. Did you forget what I can do? The hunting you down with the spirits of the jungle, she asked, deathly calm. Dilbert pulled his beak free. I guess I did forget, he answered, and Delta had to walk into the river for a moment, excuse herself, as choked laughter began to escape. Rail's boisterous laugh was unashamed and its volume. Davina, you have the greatest tastes. Your bird is funny. Rail grinned, and Delta peered out of the water, enjoying the scene. She blinked at the most unexpectedly high-pitched giggle that left the woman's mouth. Ah, yes, my bird. I too really like his jokes. You're welcome to come here and more any time. Davina offered, her posture turning a little shy. Dalbert squawked in alarm at her tone, but Davina shoved him into one of the pouches that she had made. I have to go, feed my bird, and do things. Davina backed away, and Rail tried to come closer, still dropping water from his greenish skin. I will come and find you soon, Dev. May I ask what your bird's name is? Dilbert's voice broke free of the punch. Inchi! Delta frowned and decided the bird was allowed to choose its own name. Dev and Inchi, I like it. I must go now. Never know when someone might need help. Rail waved and bowed to Delta before he vanished back into the water. Delta's mind had frozen, so she didn't actually give him a proper farewell. Rail's words were replayed over and over in her head. Dev and Inchi. Dev and Inchi. The bird had just topped anything Delta had done. It had sacrificed its own name to make a joke. Delta needed to evolve that bird as soon as possible, one way or another. Can you bring up the monsters and available rooms on the second floor? Delta requested with a grin. 
Rooms, layer, one remaining 15 mana. Mushroom Grove, jungle version available, 25 mana. Mudroom, 10 mana. Spider Room, 15 mana. Monsters, Rog Tribesman, 10 mana. Rog Witch Doctor, 20 mana. Crayclaw, 13 mana. The list seems small and a confused answer, as most system related things did. Why can't I purchase goblins or a storeroom? I mean, I get the spider room and the cray claw from the first floor. Delta trailed off as a box appeared. Each floor can only hold items suitable for it. I cannot produce rooms that will not fit nor survive each floor. Goblins, while hardy, do not do well in such open air and light. A storage room connected to a random jungle doesn't fit your idea of a jungle. The system will do what it can, but ultimately, the limit of what can be done begins and ends with yourself. Delta stared at New's box. Where have you been? She asked, but suggested his words. New seemed to pause. Business. Boring stuff. Nothing you'd enjoy. In the distance, the ground hummed as a pipe organ seemed to travel the floor. Delta gave New a long look. I did say that you wouldn't enjoy it. Not that it wasn't fun. Maestro is currently working on various themes for Fran. I suggested a basic drum war, but the mushroom insisted on trying a few things out. Pipe organs are all wrong for Fran, but you know artists. Yeah, I know Mr. Mushy as an artist. She replied dryly and knew took a moment to answer. How can two spores be so different? Anyway, as I was saying, your image of a jungle limits your choices. You can manually make them if you wish. The rooms, I mean. But even now, the idea of a storeroom clashes with what you wish, no? New seemed to be pretty confident, which made his words even more annoying when Dalton knew that he was right. So, I'll just make new monsters and new rooms, but... The Mushroom Grove, why has it gone some extra? She asked, and her finger hovered on the option. New turned his box to look at it. At this point, I suspect it is some ancient ritual involving the stars aligning under the dark moon and three demonic maids blow their noses, and a teacup crafted by a god accidentally being shattered that caused it. Your luck is about so. Delta sighed. No, come on, my luck is fine. She crossed her arms, nodding with confidence. Mila watched as a man got down from his horse. The beast looked experienced, and his rider no different. Place is looking lively, he said with a way of greeting, and Mila only waited. She knew the man well enough to sense a trap. There was a pause as the man slowly looked around. So, how's the weather been? Any grandkids? That's a new hairstyle. Mila, is that pie you're baking in that house? Smells great. Is there a new dungeon around? He asked in rapid fire speed. Mila narrowed her eyes and the horse snorted, backing away nervously. Tax collector Noland, your being here is about as welcome as a wart on my ass. The weather is great until you showed up. I have no grandkids, thanks for reminding me. It's a pie, but you're not getting any, and yes, there is a dungeon about. Mila replied each question slowly and clearly. Nolan itched as he scratched his beard. The man looked like a noble on the run, but really, Mila knew that the man had a decent talent with magic and a knife he kept hidden in his left boot. The fact that he still had his shiny baubles, rings and gold chains only reminded Mila that she wasn't dealing with a pampered skyhorn. And it wasn't reported because he trailed off, giving her a long look, waiting for her to dig her own grave. All magical and physical means of communicating were simultaneously disabled. Cause unknown, which means we couldn't do anything to report it. Thank the gods that you showed up. Mila gave him a thin smile. Nolan raised one brow and looked around at the people. And no one traveled to inform someone because of... What? He paused. Mina thought about it. I'm pretty sure most of us out here are banned from the capital, and the rest simply did not give a crap. Do feel free to attempt to arrest whoever you see fit. I'll greatly enjoy the show. Mila turned and shut the door in the man's face. Where is the local peacekeeper? Nolan squawked in alarm. Mila yanked the door open, leading a water mage that barely speaks the Valyrian tongue to a boy that barely understands the world beyond his own heart, to help rescue a girl that barely knows any respect from a demon that barely knows how to control himself, to help out a dungeon that barely knows how to be a dungeon, down the street and follow the sounds of ducks. Mila growled and slammed the door again. There was a beat of silence, before Mina could barely hear Nolan speaking to his horse. I hate this town. This room is being weird, Delta exclaimed as the room refused to form in any of the walls. 
It is, perhaps, it needs a special material or location. New suggestion made Delta look at the mushroom grove option again. It was just hoping that I could control the mushrooms on the floor with this room, but it won't even form. Delta sat down with a groan and curled up, wishing that she was in her pond. Dirt and stone didn't work. She even tried Bob's tunnel, but that was a bust as well. She only had three rooms, so she wasn't near the max limit yet. She laid flat on her back and stared up at the ceiling. I could ask this, maybe she knows. Delta thought about it, the frustration trying to purchase simple room getting to her. Purchase room is the most advantageous spot possible. She called up in a vain hope. There was a silence and Delta looked at her menu. That isn't fair. Delta sat straight with a disbelieving look in her eye. That worked, she demanded. New seemed to blink in and out of existence. I don't have the command listed. Did you just make a new command prompt? What even is the reference of most advantageous in this situation? News writing looked agitated, but Delta shrugged. Anything is better than not having it, so the advantage would be simply forming it, which is simple for sis who knows what to do, but I, um, guess that I should have asked the location first. Delta laughed nervously and knew was quiet for a moment. Yes, what the system thinks and what we want is vastly two different things. We can only hope that this room is somewhat that doesn't cause problems. Next time, show me the best location in your opinion might be better. But at least we learned this lesson before our lives depended on it. Now, let's go find it. Delta stood with a grin. News excitement for all things progressive on the dungeon was infectious. Jungle Mushroom Grove has been made. By purchasing this room, you have gained one rare monster. Pygmy Myconid Chieftain. By unlocking the Chieftain, you've unlocked the Pygmy Myconid as a purchasable monster for the floor. By unlocking the Chieftain, you've unlocked two Pygmy Myconids for free. The Jungle Mushroom Grove has unlocked the following options. Giant Mushrooms. Mushrooms as big as some trees. Create a unique fun jungle. Clusters of bud curdling mushrooms and starlight mushrooms will be grown for free. Research has been unlocked into further mushroom fund. Ambush tunnels for the pygmy. Increase growth for all mushrooms on the floor. Decrease the cost of all mushroom monsters, upgrades, and purchases. Delta stared at the scream. The shroomy abyss stared back. Delta, please don't screw. Delta didn't quite remember the next few minutes, but from what Davina told her later, Maestro thought he had been challenged to an opera duel. She neared the only entrance in the room, the hole in the ground that led to the underground cavern. The reason why the room refused to be formed before, it could only be built underground. She peered into something and peered back at her. It was only about a foot or something big. It had large, round eyes, like little smudges of wall paint on its face. A little skirt made of grass of the jungle and a little hat to cover its cap made of sticks. A flower was carried like a flag. Around its neck was a string that led down to a pretty adorable wooden trouble mask that was easily pulled up to cover its face. At its side there were three tiny wooden sticks and a little tiny bag. Delta guessed that they could be fruits. It tilted its head and made a little squeaking sound at her, waving almost shyly. Delta felt her heart explode as she left into the abyss to get a closer look. She completely missed another pygmy mushroom using the flutes to blow the tiny darts at a curious bud hair that stuck its head in to look. She also missed the larger chieftain drawing up a rough map of the jungle in the dirt, making perfect ambush spots. New didn't. New saw it all. He decided that he would tell Delta about the new monster's little issues later. Much, much later. Seth, I think you're pushing him too hard now. Quiz suggested and he watched Dio's eyes read the first line of the book over and over. Seth looked haggard, like a water lily dried out and remaining foods replaced with coffee. Dio has not passed one tricky word test yet. Grudy will be naughty schoolgirl for the rest of existence. Seth stressed. Quiz opened his mouth and then closed his eyes. You need to learn context, seriously. It's fine, it's only been a day. Rudy gets free lunches as a student, and the building has a dorm for sleeping. Dio, are you okay? Chris asked awkwardly, not being used to being gentle. The boy looked up with a deep wisdom. I know the word insightful now, he bragged, and Chris gave him a weak smile. Know it, know what it means, he asked, and Dio grinned sheepishly. 
Chris looked at Seth. We have to do a Fenric. He said simply in Seth's eyes bugged out. Fenric? We helped him learn like that, and dear will be death. Seth's grip on the language slipped as his stress skyrocketed. As much as dying, we become more cheery process with Dio in charge. I doubt it's an issue. We simply have to encourage him to learn in a different manner. He's like me. Books and lectures, not a chance. Quiz scrimmaged and Dio's mother came in with a third set of refreshments since they arrived. I heard my Dio has good intentions. He's trying to learn. She promised them and Quiz nodded at her, trying not to let her see how much her voice affected him. Even at a whisper, Isolana Brando had a voice that charmed the world, sometimes quite literally. The voice of a mixed heritage between love and beauty, which was then fused with the blood of rage and violence to give birth to Dio. It was a family tree that Quist didn't want to think about. Dio being Dio was more than anyone could really ask for the boy. We know, I just want to test something. Maybe see if he learns the way that I did. Is that okay? He asked her politely, and Isolana gave him a soft look of curiosity. Mr. Jones was very capable, and he's only been able to do so much. She tried to point out, and Quiz gave her a grin that seemed to take away the woman by surprise. Quiz remembered how he tended to look when he smiled and dropped it fast as Isolana's eyes went wide. With all due respect, classrooms and tests don't work with everyone. I never had an apprentice, and I think Dio will be good to test for my teachings. He promised her, and Isolana hesitated. I don't think that I want my son to be. She trailed off as she looked at the Quiz and then outside through the window. Throwing fire about, understandable. Quiz muttered, but the woman shook her head. No, not the fire, the ducks. My husband went out to get rid of them, and I haven't seen him in about an hour, as Solana pointed out. Quiz blinked slowly at her, not revealing anything. The blush on his neck was bad enough. They do tend to bring people back. If not, I can go find him. The duck portal does go both ways. He assured her, and Seth looked up at the empty cup in his hands. Seth waved a hand over the room and enchanted. Face twisted, the souls beyond screamed. Quiz's ears popped and Dio seemed to have a vision, but then the cup was refilled with a fresh coffee and Seth sipped it with a blank expression at his face. I hate that spell, Quiz told the other mage. Seth met his eyes with a dark look. I don't trust boiling water or pots anymore, he reminded and Quiz's own eyes went distant. Hotter, Quiz, hotter. We will brew the tea of the age, Seth, more water. Pour me one, he said finally as Dio stared down at the book. I don't understand this at all. He sighed and his mother turned to the book upside down. Dio peered at it and made a sound of understanding. Quiz almost broke his neck to glare at Seth, who looked away. I don't read your words, merely speak, though looked odder than usual. He muttered and Quiz opened the window to throw out another duck and it made contact with a man's face. Are you the peacekeeper? He asked slowly as he pulled the calm duck away from his hair. Quiz didn't know him. He was a stranger that looked like new to town. That set alarm bells off in Quiz's head. Quiz's headache became worse than he merely nodded. The man held the duck in his arms and began to speak. Excellent. I need a tour of the dungeon as per the dungeon law. Article 12b, where it states that the local peace, the man droned on. And on and Quiz closed the window, and the man didn't seem to notice that he was now speaking to himself. Dio, burn the books, we're going to see Delta. Seth, go back to school and learn to read. Quiz said and turned to Solana. What's the strongest alcohol do you have? He asked bluntly, and the woman looked at the man, still talking with eyes closed outside the window. Stuff to get my husband tipsy. No offense, but it'll hit you like a horse. She warned and Quiz held out his hand. However, the woman pulled on her coat instead of fetching the desirable booze. I'll come with you to see the dungeon and keep an eye on my son. She stated Quiz looked at his empty hand, but the woman snapped her fingers and her voice rose just slightly. You're working, go, get ready. She snapped and all three males jumped to attention. Quiz found himself almost combing his hair before he realized that he didn't care. He hoped Delta kept her dungeon tame. Mimes and frog people, if Ruli was right, was more than enough to make the trip a bother. Anything else could be uh, troublesome. End of chapter. There is no epic lucha, only puns. Chapter 57. The Musical Trap. Thank you. I know that you don't... This... This means a lot. 
Delta gave a slight shrug, had a small smile spreading on her face. I'm good at spur of the moment ideas and making things nicer, but when it comes to defending myself, Delta trailed off and itched her nose. Newsbox blinks to few times. Your ideas are good in their own way, but I am better at designing more uh, underhanded trials. I know I went a little too power mad the last time, so I promise to control myself this time. The blue box turned slightly, as if to show news excitement. Delta grinned and watched as the two pygmy mushrooms ran around, swinging their flowers around like umbrellas. She fought back with a noise that would break glass and focused on news box. It was now spitting out a text too fast for Delta to read, before the new text took its place. Slow down, I can't read that fast, Delta said exasperatedly, which made news words slow to a crawl. Sorry, I just have so many ideas. May we start with the first floor? Of course, it's easier since it has more to work with. Delta stood and stretched and walked towards the stairs. Taking a few seconds to look back at the pygmy hole, New went left-sided again. Delta had just nodded when she saw the question mark with a combination of different symbols. New was... Delta had noticed the box was actually looking a little transparent. Well, she was playing with the new monsters, New floated off to the side and did nothing. His responses to her questions fell flat, even a little pre-prepared. To Delta, she got a sense of being there for the sake of appearances. New felt bored. In retrospect, it was painfully obvious thing that would happen. He had done nothing but watch, talk to a few monsters, but be locked out of the floor due to Grimm and the others. New went crazy when he had taken over the last time as Delta dove into Reddy's soul. He had loved it so much that he did as much as possible within the thought and care. Delta hadn't given him much thought and New began his weird way of looking back. It was a sign. Symbolic news sign. She watched as one of her picnics vanished up in a tiny tunnel set up in the room. Delta had no idea where it went. New sped on ahead and Delta began to fly after him, not wanting to let anything new did escape her sight. She trusted the box, but caution was a good thing to have no matter what. Since Maestro is now a secret monster behind the walls, and the unusual potential of this tunnel between the goblin camp and Fran's room has always irked me, I want to fix this. Delta stood as the unused space then could admit that without Maestro's former form, it was a little lonely. So, what's the old ticker in your head plotting? She prodded and saw the text and news box shift and stretch as a simple diagram form. It showed a hallway was slowly being filled with a crisscross square pattern, and in each wall was a bunch of X's appeared. Chess with X's and O's? She hesitated a guess. News box went blank and Delta could almost hear the sigh. Games are an interesting concept for gambling down the line. But no, I was referring to the layout of a complicated... No, a series, a gauntlet, for the, may I just show you? Delta stepped back as if to give New the floor. She felt a tug on herself and her manner began to drop. From the space near the boss's door, all the way to the goblin camp, perfect squares of empty space hollowed out of the ground. A dozen or so traps, but not very deep. An adult may come up to them with the thighs at most. I saved mana by halving their size, so it is not going to bankrupt you. Now, let's add the harder part. Delta watched with surprise and expression as a crisscross dark grey metal mesh slid out from the bottom of the wall that covered the floor. I get the holes, but why the metal fence to stop people falling in? She muttered but knew just kept working. Delta watched her 43 mana, recently topped off by Hob and Gob, drop to 25. A fresh layer of dirt appeared on the top and it looked solid and Delta could barely see the difference between the goblin camp and the dirt and the new one. Holes, fences, and new dirt. I like it, Delta joked, and New shook his box. Patience, the fence is for your ease of mind. Watch. Delta floated back to the goblin camp and looked at the tunnel that led to the boss room. Now, with the amount of trees donated by Ruli and the lumberjack fellow, wood is a little cheaper than most things. New explained as a wood arch formed around the mouth of the tunnel. It was a simple carved arch with various crude goblin faces looking down at the visitor. Delta could spot soft impressions of Swa, Num, and Billy, with Hob and Gob acting as torch holders, their mouths made of stone, and either side of the tunnel. Francis' face was placed in the very center of the arch's crossed beams. 
Your wood carving is much better than your pottery. Delta beamed and Lou's box dimmed to a glower. The pot knowledge was just that funky. I can only do so much. Near the bottom, and low enough that even a goblin wouldn't have to look down, Lou peered into the wooden carving and the face that looked like Billy's, and Delta followed his example as he saw a tiny keyhole. Lou's box flashed and Delta felt her manner drop to twelve. The wooden key formed and appeared in the keyhole, flowing like liquid until the block-like head appeared last. Step one, done. Now let's see if we can get two to work in tandem. New seemed to distant as he focused on his work before him. Why a wooden key seems a little fragile. Delta asked and she examined the newly made key. Hmm? Oh, the key. One, wood is cheap. Two, it's insurance. If the goblins are overpowered, they'll arm the trap and crush the key. No point in setting it up so that there are just invaders to undo all the work by wondering why the goblin has a key. Obviously, I'm aiming for it to be regenerated after a period, but I'll work on that. Now, I just need to spend some DP. News text turned slow and hesitant. Delta blinked. It's fine, go for it, she encouraged. New paused. It's not your permission or such that is stopping me, but... I get this feeling of something when I feel the DP. New turned and floated back and forward, pacing his thoughts. Delta allowed him a few seconds to gather himself before she gently spoke. What feeling? She prodded. New stopped moving. Finality. It's foolish. Let's continue. New's words took on the tone of his usual grumbling, and the tunnel and the arch began to glow as Delta's DP began to drop from a hearty 90 to a still decent 68. Nothing seemed to change, but New had turned to speak to the curious goblins watching. Numb turned the key gently. Swa watched his half-closed eyes and the very image of a bored pyromancer, but Delta could see how sharp his gaze was about the whole event. Billy was readable as ever, aloof and about as expressive as a nocturnal predator. Num, using two thick fingers, turned the key. There was a muffled grinding noise. Delta spun and then looked at New for an explanation. The metal mesh slid away. It, that it? I mean, the holes might twist some ankles, so it's not bad. Delta smiled weakly, trying to sound supportive. New turned to face her, and she could feel the annoyed look that he sent the box flashing with a flat emoticon. I am not finished. I would waste so much effort on being so inefficiently petty. Watch. The random parts of the floor and the various pitfalls that Delta had to guess, and a glow appeared in Delta's DP dropped again with the rest of her manner, leaving her with shy of three. Now, I can't proceed any further on arming the rest of the holes, so those three will have to do for now. I added pressure plates as those recently got added to the trap menu for various things. I didn't bother showing it to you as your general vibe towards traps is lukewarm at best. Downright illogical at worst. Now you'll see the result of proper planning. News box glowed with a pride and a tiny hole appeared above one of the pitfalls with a trigger plate. Delta's DP dropped to 55 and the hole glowed. There was a beta silence and news box turned slightly paler blue which Delta took as a slight blush. Num, go walk over to that part of the tunnel. Ah, okay, boss. Num nodded and body moving with the grace of a blind bolter. But Delta saw that the goblin was looking more muscular since the last time she had had a good look at him. Num took a few steps and then he hit the first trap hole, sinking down to his waist before he huffed and climbed out. He continued like this, falling into more holes until he reached where New wanted. The moment he sunk down, there was a sharp click, and the hole above began to puff up in purple dust. Num looked straight up, allowing the dust to collect in his eyes. He snarled in confusion, and then the goblin simply toppled over without any further sound. Delta's mouth dropped open for a brief moment and looked like Num had simply died on the spot, and then the goblin snorted and rolled over falling into another hole and starting to snore like an angry saw blade, feet pointing straight up in the air. I call this particular dual-layered trap the lazy step. 
Saved for future uses, of course. It would cost far more to make the trap user-friendly in targeted department. And trying to make it the only effect certain people was beyond annoying to achieve. Hence, the mesh fence to close on traps off until the key is used. It saves time and effort, really. I have it set to reset both traps to regenerate the key on a random monster on this floor after destruction. I have covered all loose ends, made a trap that lives up to your moral code, and even made it look easy. You seem to glow, and despite his bragging, Delta had to admit that he was right. Nu was really good at making the most of so little. He was like one of those old players at a game that somehow made the basic health potion kill the final boss through annoying logic and quick thinking. Delta paused. The game? Where had that thought come from? Delta put a hand on her chin and something teetered on the edge of coherence. A thought or a memory. Now, follow me. I want to show you more. The gobs will be back soon and I think that woman, Dabagost, has started to give them her apples for some of her fruit for very rich manner. Delta stumbled, often knew, a teasing thought slipping away from the forgotten dream. That's nice of her. I wonder if she'll come and visit again. She added his new rush to the entrance. As on cue, three forms appeared. Delta looked at the shadow standing in the opening door. Gob hob, Lenny? Sure enough, the mime was walking in, looking very thin, though not quite as emaciated as when she was first found him. His body strengthened as flesh pulled out in the weight and muscle. Goblin Hop bulked up as well. Then he moved an invisible bag over his shoulder, making a lot of objects shifted. Quite a few rabbits, a few fish, and a couple of rocks with the bronze and silvery veins running through them. Delta supposed having only to imagine what tool you needed to make harvesting things rather easy. The fact that Rennie had grown up in a traveling circus might also explain why the mime was taking some trips outside. Great job, guys. Delta beamed before she let the familiar cram flow through her. her who has the mushroom? Delta gasped and Rennie pulled out a bunch of rot gut mushrooms tied together in a bouquet of flowers. And then another and another. No, she begged, but the mime heartily dropped them all with a flourish. Well, at least we have mana and DP. It's for the greater good. You can do it. Delta glared at the cheerfulness and, with a flash of annoyance, gripped the number power that she was growing familiar with and tried to focus on new. Much like Davina when she first found Rennie, there was a moment of being in two places at once. It almost felt like a meditative experience. Until New started to curl his box in on itself. Oh god, that's vile! Spit it out! Dropping the connection, Delta felt a sweet taste of vengeance wash away some of the mushroom. Rennie looked like an angel with a demon smile. You're hilarious, she deadpanned as she glared at the mime before he checked her notifications. Common Durance hair unlocked. Silver material unlocked. Dusky fireflies unlocked. Juicy grapes unlocked. Mellow Banana Unlocked Mana 65 DP 93 Delta nodded with satisfaction. Every new unlock brought something to the table. With the fish, spiders, mushrooms, everything had a use. Though she really had to wonder how Dabagast made bananas grow in such a climate. Delta talked it up to because she's damn well wanted to. To be honest, Delta just liked knowing that she could make things look good with the silver and fireflies. It wasn't exactly a logical thought like New might have, but she made the fireflies powerful enough. Would Maestro like them as spotlights? Could she make the pond room look magical? Would the fireflies feel at home? Delta looked down at her hands. New, you're right, she admitted, which made the box stop twisting in disgust. I know I am, but tell me what about... I'm not really good with being a dungeon, but you are. I can make things really interesting, and I understand how people work. You can see items that I wouldn't think of and make the best things out of them. I'm good with monsters, unlocking special things about them, but you're great at finding the secrets of traps and items. Delta rambled and then stopped. She took a deep breath and looked at staring new. I want to promote you from a menu to Trap Master. I want to trust you to defend us and make sure that I don't leave some stupid path to all of our deaths, but I also trust you not to get us killed with going overboard. 
You can use the monsters if they agree, and the rooms and anything in them. You do so much and you deserve something for it. Delta grinned and waited. A few seconds passed with nothing appearing on News box. New, Delta called with a little worry. Rennie tilted his head, looking at the goblins for answers, but they merely shrugged at him. Delta moved closer, but as she reached out and touched the news box, cracked down the center like a breaking glass. Delta fell backwards as the glass exploded outwards and the shards swirling around New. New! Delta yelled with alarm, her hands trying to reach out as the glass began to smash each other into orbiting moons around New's box. The box itself looked solid, more vibrant and with more divine border. As the last of the glass fled from its surface, the glass moon stopped and the glass rippled before smoothing over into a solid single glass pieces. They each slowly formed five tiny spindly points. Fingers, Delta stated stupidly as two floating robot-like hands flexed and relaxed. On the screen, two eyes blinked rapidly, a mouth appeared and opened with a slow effort. Stop doing things. Delta flinched as News face scrunched up before it wiped itself with a burst of uh, ones and zeros. Text returned and words flowed across the screen. Much better. Now, what did you do? News hands waved in the air with the appearance of wanting to throttle Delta. I just promoted you, she said slowly. New jabbed a finger at her. Have I not warned you about spontaneous changing of only world that I know? Delta looked down at the ceiling, as if looking for something interesting. In not so many words, she tried, and New rubbed his chin with his one hand, before he paused and looked at the new appendages. Hands are not the worst thing that you could have done, I suppose. If you had made me grow legs, I would be running experiments to test the solidity of the form's posterior right at this very moment. I like floating. Hands, I can deal with these. New turned and smacked Delta on the back over the head. It was a solid smack and Daltus was stunned for several seconds. Contact. Actual physical contact. She turned and grabbed New with both hands. They were solid, firm, a little cold, but they moved. Delta let out a delighted laugh as she hopped around, spinning New as she moved. His hands moved a fair distance away from her body before it was forced to follow. New, I can touch you. Before, you fall like wet paper, and now you feel like a person. She said with a bright smile. Newsbox tried to form words, but every rotation of Delta's spin made the text fade like a sketch pad. Rennie shook his head and shook Gob and Hob's hands before casually walking down the tunnel. The mime nodded to the spiders as they began the second afternoon royal ball. Rennie slowed near the pond where the duck watched him. He had not forgotten the battle previously. The way his powers had utterly broken under the duck that had cursed him, it was unpleasant. He began to turn his head back down to the second floor when he paused. He felt a vibration. A hum. He traveled down the path that he had never been down. Being on a contracted monster, he didn't feel uncomfortable or out of place on another floor the way that the dungeon born might. Still, there was something in the air that wasn't quite to his taste. To him, it might just be a personal taste. To a dungeon born, it might be a slightly more physical reaction. His respect for the mushroom, Mr. Mushy, rose with each step. The monster never showed any discomfort at visiting the second floor. The duck as well. If he had fought him on another floor, even if he had the demon woman as a shield, when he slowed, did he feel a rivalry with the duck? He couldn't stop adding the beast to his thoughts. Was it a contracted thing? Rennie had no idea, but he'd like to see who would win in equal ground. The duck had so much growth to go through. Rennie knew of its kind. The duck was barely fresh from its nest. He entered some of the forms of storeroom, simplistic, but the torches and luminous mushrooms made it look more peaceful. The air also turned almost tasty. Rennie followed the sound of humming to the part of the wall. He pushed and felt the wall didn't have much weight behind it. A secret tunnel. Delta was full of surprises. Like with New evolving a tool into something more, monsters, he could understand. It was a natural path. He himself had such an option of a long time ago. But it was like evolving a sword or a book. How had Delta done it? Rennie wasn't sure, but he could only hope when he came to time for him to suddenly become a supermime, he would have some warning. 
not that he would mind that much, with nothing else left in the world and his only home now a permanent fixture of the dungeon. Rennie didn't mind being in the dungeon. Under a slightly less human core, he would have been removed as a threat. That would have been that. Delta had come to him in his darkest pit of his soul and offered him the choice, much like his father. He offered Rennie a choice every day, stay or be free. Always a choice. For someone who could not speak naturally, being heard was something he would always cherish, even if he was from one of the weirdest women that he had ever met. He knocked on the wall and the humming stopped. There was a hiss and the wall was pulled back and Rennie briefly saw the retreating vine-like thing vanish around the corner. Oh, a guest, well don't be shy, I never turned down an audience. A voice filled with mirth and a purr called out. It reminded Rennie of a performer, a very, very energetic performer. Turning the corner, he was surprised to see that the tunnel expand into the giant room with some stone pyramid-like structure. The stone itself covered in a viney fungal growth. Upon the top, like of some growing figure of worship, sat a giant mushroom. Rennie really didn't know why he should suspect that it would be anything else at this point. It leered down at him, its face a thing of nightmares, but its eyes held a welcoming glint. Rennie, confident in his powers to at least escape, walked forward, noting as he did so that several tiny mushrooms which grew on each layer of the pyramid like a line of watches and various odd fungal instruments seemed to grow from the floors and walls as well. As he climbed up the first step and passed another layer, the mushrooms burst into a long choral hymn. The higher he went, the higher the mushroom's pitch went until he stood before the biggest one of them all. It swept out one arm and a wide arc, and every mushroom went quiet. Now, look at this. Delta has let some cats in before, but I don't think we've met. Now, I'm just dying to hear all about you. He tapped one long needle-like finger against his chest. Rennie tilted his head in an unusual creature. The mushroom seemed to blink and then snapped his fingers. Of course, how rude. Let's talk about me first. Quite wise. Well, let me introduce you to the little mushrooms that goes by the names of Maestro. Please, no autographs until the end of the tour. Maestro winked, a joyous so a piano sounded out and accompanying the action. If Rennie hadn't already seen his own face reflected in various lakes when yawning after a bad night's sleep, he might have been disturbed. Rennie bowed in a smooth arc. Oh, the strong and silent type, eh? Off to save a princess. <laughs> Just a jest. Forgive me, but bring such a gentle mime to my little slice of heaven. He asked, and Rennie shrugged and looked around at the room. The vines and fungal growth seemed to vanish down into the ground itself, as well as into the walls. Curiosity melted the cat. You're a lucky fellow that I put my edgy self away when only melt critics now. Maestro purred, and Rennie walked around and saw growths of drums, a thin foam growing across the surface to act as a drum head. Out of habit, he mimed an action of drumming, and he produced no sound, but he felt Delta's part of now rested inside of his soul buzz in reaction. Maestro paused. Interesting, he murmured for the first time. Rennie felt that he's wary of his turned his back to Maestro. The giant creature held out two hands, and from the ceiling, something dropped into them. It was a metallic instrument covered in yet more mushrooms. You got the power, honey, but have you got the touch? Maestro asked, voice turning serious. I've got a case of lonely blues, and a fellow player walks into my little room. How can I turn that down? Come now, don't be shy. Bear your soul and show your moves. The maestro pointed dramatically at Rennie. Rennie itched his chin, thinking about it. He could just go home, play with Wilhelm, annoy Davina, sleep. Tidy up the statue, sleep, go on another gathering trip with the goblins, or he could stay a while and listen to the odd talking mushroom. That seemed to be able to hear his musical abilities. Rennie itched a little harder and he brought his full smile to the surface. He stretched out his hands and brought them down across several surfaces. He only knew how to play some instruments, a habit one learned when a circus music for the show was all homemade. The thumps and drums buzzed his soul, and Maestro let loose a mighty laugh as if very tiny mushrooms echoed it, making the room sound like a bustling entertaining hall. Maestro brought a metal instrument to his lips, and the sound Rennie had never heard before blasted out on a wide mouth of the thing. 
It was a wondrous that Rennie decided that he could just stay for a while, before Delta did something else and changed everything. This was his home now, and Rennie didn't mind it so much. End of chapter There is no epic lucha, only puns. Chapter 58 Thorn in the Side Holly Davagos set her hot pie on the table. It was a pie that Holly made a dozen times with dozens of variants, but with just as much love put into each one. One of her children, Yiga, the eldest, walked past with a hungry expression. The flowers that she had braided into her long, dark hair looked to be full bloom, despite being cut from the stems for a short time. Holly cut a piece of pie without a word. Yiga was going through a very important part of her life. As a natural-born druid, Holly could be no prouder. Yiga picked up the pie and Holly saw that her skin had a hue of fresh tree bark. That did not speak because Holly did not want to force her to do such a human thing. Her husband slipped occasionally, but the man always directed his questions quickly to the nearest inanimate object. Yiga sighed with joy as the pie slice disappeared very quickly. She hugged her mother before leaving through the back door into the garden. Holly smiled and her retreating back. She saw how Yiga's feet seemed to almost sink into the solid earth, as if they were welcoming her. The approaching vibrancy of life let her know that her husband had entered the room, even if all physical senses didn't pick him up. Any idea what's going to happen? He asked softly. An age-old question. Those with nature's blessing in them must choose. To walk as flesh and blood as a warrior, or become as nature, a guardian with wood and sap. Yiga was on a fine balance, but in the end, the choice will continue to chase her. Every second is a reminder of both worlds. Holly explained she had lost count of how many times she'd have to do so. Holly turned to look at Kota. The man was not impressive. He didn't have a handsome face, nor an impressive world. He wasn't intelligent enough to change the world, nor charming enough to win any heart. But he loved, and Holly couldn't ask for more. The fool had loved her even when she was ready to remove his head for insolence. Holly smiled at the memory, her round cheeks splashing as the thought about how rash she had been. Gota's shaggy head was slightly befuddled, features had grown like moss over Holly's heart, and it hadn't been long before she had given him a special plant to show her affection. The idiot planted it instead of using it like a potion, like Holly had intended, but the action just endeared him more and retired archdruid. Gota helped himself to the slice of the pie as two furious voices argued over something. Treg, her middle child, screamed something about swords as the younger Selda fired back of magic. Holly fanned the scent of pie towards the stairs of the house and waited. I just wish I could help. Go to the side and he stared out the door. Being a rock in the storm is all that you can do. Influencing her towards one path or another is just not something that I will allow. Once you choose life, it is all you have. If you choose humans to keep you happy, she will be gone regardless. The emptiness of the wrong choices has killed many a rash steward. Holly stoked Kota's head softly, removing the tangled locks where she found them. Treg rushed into the kitchen. The boy took after his father, hair down to his back and looking like he was dragged through the hedge backwards. Solder waddled after, furiously determined to be the first to the table. Like Yiga, the two would have to choose who they would be in the future. Holly would love them no matter what, but she knew Kota would take it hard. Tell me why he stayed. Kota whispered as he wrapped her two arms around his waist. Holly raised a brow. You know why. I've told you the tale a dozen times. She reminded and Kota grinned easily, making a splotch of some chemical of solution stand out. Holly licked one thumb and cleaned the stain with a warm smile. The foolish human knocked on my forest hut's door, seeking immortality in a bottle. He offended an archdruid, almost killed himself, and then, at the worst possible moment, that man told me I looked like a goddess, and I'm very good at sensing lies. I decided that the human life was more treasures for me to find yet. She whispered as the children devoured the pie. Holly, without looking, to pulled two slices for her husband and herself to eat later. Oh, shush. Treg pointed out the window, with mouth fold with pie. A nearby plant twisted into some horrific shape, and Holly soothed it back into a normal. Holly turned and scowled on her face. 
ready to scold her child for speaking in tongues, but froze when she saw Isolnella and her son Dio kiss and an unknown man. She went closer to the window to get a better look. The man turned to look around the village, a skull on his face. One of the many trinkets glinted in the sunlight. Polly went still. Every plant within the area stiffened, and a slight rumble shook the house. Holly, Kota rushed to her side. Holly grabbed his hand at a reaction to her feelings. Kota watched the children. I'm going out, she told him. She had slipped into the odd accent that let Kota know there would be no argument. Kota nodded and grabbed her hand as he moved to leave. Stay firm, stay green, he said before he kissed her. Holly softened for a moment. I'll be back, she promised, and gathered her things to quickly catch up with the group. She knew exactly where they were heading. She would not let Delta fall. She would not let her become a cow for the slaughter. Never again. Waiting for more manor was boring. Delta loved Hob and Gob for being such hard workers, but the wait was going to be hard. So in the meantime, she drew up some ideas. We'll grow more apples on the healing herbs, and then we can set up a trade with durance. I mean, if we produced enough of a variety in the jungle, we could sell it to Mrs. Dambergost, or Rudy if she wants to hunt some of the critters later. The hot spring, the rest area, we just need to market them. The berries, spiderweb, and various mushrooms, Mr.'s pots, basic iron, and fish. We have more than you think. The issue is what we haven't felt ready to invite the world down until our security was ready. Besides, you're assuming a lot of Durance's financial standing or ability to trade. Sure, Damagos can give us plants, and maybe Rudy can give us a bunch of trees once in a while, but we honestly just don't know enough about the town. It's all second-hand knowledge. Delta sighed. Not exactly like I can go out for a stroll and introduce myself. She reminded him, a new merrily glowed in the moment. Of course, I just want you to know that there is a chance that people are powerful, but have nothing but each other. Planning on things you are unaware of or can't control is risky. What do you suggest? Delta asked instead of arguing. New looked at the entrance, his new hands clasping together as he thought aloud. Something has been bugging me. Damn, that was not intentional. Ugh. We have not heard a peep from the giant spiders. At all. Not even Gob and Hob seem to run into them. Delta looked at the closed entrance door and frowned. I guessed since Rudy and Cram, that lumberjack, cut down the forest around here, they'd ran away. She admitted, but New turned to her. No, even before that, before the door, they went quiet. Rudy explained how monsters are drawn to dungeons like bees to flowers. What changed? I don't know. We defeated the ones that came when Dio first visited. Then they just stopped. Why are you suddenly worried? Maybe Duran sent someone to get rid of them. She pointed out and New was quiet for a moment. Shame, that's a lot of free mana and TP to go to waste. Delta turned to him with a startled look. Monsters, you felt it. There was no rational thought or control in those spiders. Animals mutated out of control. You have no problem with hob and gob collecting fish and rabbits. Why not giant spiders? And that would speed everything up and it would keep the people of Jiren safe at night. The words were tempting, but Delta knew that New had a good enough feel for her character to manipulate her slightly. And if we kick some nest and start a war with the spiders, she prodded with a finger. We shut the door and squashed them in the morning. If they try to attack Durance, I would enjoy seeing that. Quiz alone would burn them to a crisp. Rudy would eat them. Come now, we both know you're more worried about your gobs getting hurt. So stop fretting and spend some DP on them. It really is simple. Pay the cost now and get bigger rewards later. New threw both of his hands for a triumphant manner. How exactly will we go about this? Lure them in? Delta ignored New's previous words for a moment. Scout, find out what's stopping them, plan after. No need to make a five-step plan and expect the enemy to follow each step. Seriously, it's just arrogant and a waste of time to make such convoluted plans that hinges on us being 100% correct. You need to stop playing with those imaginary games with Divina and Reddy. I don't know even why I showed you guys the fantasy board games. Delta smiled softly at new scrumblings. I am a fair but hard dungeon keeper. If they insist on trying to get around me by over planning, then I'll drop the end game mush boss on their butts after the tutorial. Delta pushed back a giggle and floated down the tunnel. 
Nu had some good points by jumping from growing mushrooms and trading right into the monster hunting. It was going to take her a little time to get used to the idea. Nu made it seem good, but there were drawbacks. If the spiders were already dead, then it would be a promising plan, dashed to pieces. If something killed them, or there wasn't someone from Durance, then that would just bring the thing to her door. Delta felt safe, but there were too many unknowns about the world outside for her to be truly confident in her own defenses. If the spiders were still around, then the fact that they were keeping themselves was another thing. What if they pulled back after seeing how outmatched they were? Would there be enough awareness to warrant thinking about mass murdering them all? Did the gobs not steal some of their eggs first? If the spiders are only fed on the animals of the forest and were doing their best to avoid Delta, she wasn't sure that she could walk up and order their deaths. Being a giant spider monster alone didn't warrant the death sentence. If Rudy was here, maybe the woman could let Delta know how much of a pain the spiders had been. If they were eating lost children, feeding on the livestock, making people live in fear, then Delta wouldn't make a stand. She would do her best to remove such a danger. On the other hand, if they were just minding their own business, could she honestly justify simply attacking them, unprovoked? No, Nu was right. Delta didn't know anything about what laid outside the door. She had dived into making her home safe, better, a home for all, but there was one thing that she could do without any regret. I numb, she called out at the goblin, I was lifting Mr. Potts, filled with mud over his head. The goblin camp looked much better, with New's arch set out into the tunnel entrance. It had character to the room. The goblin rippled with muscles that the other goblins didn't have at all. Even Hob and Gob, in their delta forms, were just bigger, but not so buff. Numb slowly eased the pot down. Swa was nearby, and he yawned. 58, new record. He called as he slowly made the campfire shape to the flames into a rough goblin head. Numb grinned, the wooden key around his neck worn with pride. How can I help? Numb saluted, sweat dripping from his face. I was just thought that it was high time that you guys were due for a checkup, seeing what's appeared in your menus. Delta explained as she began to pull up the windows. She saw Billy slink out from the shadows, his curiosity peaked. Swa snapped his head. More fire! He cackled and Delta pursed her lips. We'll see, she answered noncommittally. She looked at Numb's menu first. Goblin Thug, Numb, available options. Evolve into Goblin Fighter, a goblin with excels in physical combat, natural, evolution, 20 DP, cheapened by Rudy's library. Evolved into Goblin Juggernaut, a goblin that has learned to take damage and come back fighting, natural, evolution, 25 DP. Evolve into Goblin Disciple, one who has learned to focus on the wildness of a goblin into the source of strength. 30 DP, cheapened by Ruli's Diary, a special evolution unlocked by studying with Rail. Delta stared for a long moment. Num, that's so cool. She beamed and Num laughed with a proud grin, and then slowed until he was just blinking. Uh, what'd I do? He asked, confused. Nothing on purpose. Billy commented and Numb seemed to take that as a compliment and beamed again. Delta bent down until she was face to face with Numb. She hadn't noticed it before, but as she was kept building the second floor, her monsters had slowly become able to see her more clearly. Numb looked straight at her. Numb, would you like to evolve? I don't know what you'll become exactly, but... She trailed off, but Numb had gone wide-eyed. Me? I... I can evolve! He whispered and clawed his hands clasped tightly at his sides. Delta nodded gently. Only if you want, she promised, and Numb looked down to the ground for a moment. Willie smirked and looked away. Even Swa was silent for a moment. I worked really, really hard, and I really wanted. I trained with rail and a big wow worm. Numb spoke quickly, not looking up. With some effort, Numb met Delta's eyes. She had never seen the goblin in tears, but Numb looked Soft. Please, he begged, and Delta gently put his hand on his head. Of course. No, hold still. She winked. Why let Numb's hard work go to waste? Sure, it costs more, but if Delta had one bad habit, it was taking risky choices. She hit the Goblin Disciple option. Numb was surrounded by a corona of orange light, like the sun warm cocoon. It whipped up a gust of wind, and the energy encircled tighter and tighter before it suddenly broke apart with a thunderous crash. 
Numb stood before her, but it was not the goblin that she had known. The rough fur pelts were gone. The spiky club was gone. The slightly goofy expression was gone. In its place was a goblin that gave her a soft smile. Mother, he said, his voice flowing like a soft breeze. He flexed his hands. They were wrapped in a red cloth, but his fingers didn't seem restricted. He slowly began to flex the rest of his body. The muscled torso that looked far more straight than a human that had hunched starts of a goblin. The face, once slightly goofy, now looked firm and serious. Numb had hair now and pulled back into a ponytail. His hair looked coarse but long. She looked down at the long flowing cotton trousers. He was barefoot, but even his feet looked like they'd pulsed with energy. He moved forward and the air seemed to tense and flow around his body. Numb closed his eyes and there was a slight glow around his hands. Numb, you look, she trailed off, not sure what to say. Numb grinned and it was both comforting but also that made Num look like his old self, the sweet being that she knew from before. He was still himself, but there was so much more now. There was a result from Num's hard work. A box appeared. Num has unlocked physical energy. System will name it P.E. Delta watched as Num did a soft strike into the air. There was a soft ripple. I, I mean, that's pretty. Interesting, but don't hit me or I'll burn you. Swa sniffed and Numb gave him a look before a grin reappeared. I would never harm a brother, he promised, and Swa gave him a sour look. What makes us brothers? Please, I am a magical leader. Swa sniffed back. Numb raised one eyebrow before he bowed slightly, one hand pushed into a palm. Oh, do forgive me, oh magical brother. I do believe your campfire is burning your mushrooms. Num commented, Swa screeched as the blackened mushrooms crumpled before his eyes. Delta giggled as Swa stamped towards the mushroom grove, muttering to himself, How do you feel? Delta asked brightly. Num looked at his hands. Alive. I feel alive. Power is flowing through me and I can feel that something bubbling just under my skin. Power with a cost, but it is so much of it. I could lose it all in a moment, but I know then I need to stay in control. Forgive me, mother, I need to go relax. I need to go stand under the waterfall on the second floor. I need to thank, I need to thank another brother. Numb bowed and turned, rushing down the tunnel in a burst of speed that the goblin had never had before. Wait, I wanted to check your new menu, Delta called, but the goblin had already rushed into the bathroom and shut the door. Still numb, if you know where to look, Billy commented. Delta sighed as she couldn't help but feel happy. To see one of her first monsters grow into such a form made a deep pride rise up within her. There were some really bad things about the dungeon core. The isolation at the start, the trapped feeling, the idea that you were subhuman. But there were also upsides. Delta turned to Billy, who straightened up. I'm ready, he said. Voice calm, Delta opened the menu and looked. Goblin Archer, Billy, available options. Goblin Evolution, Goblin Ranger, special goblin who works with an animal to fight foes. Random pet unlocked upon evolving. Evolve into Goblin Stalker, the goblin that uses special arrows and equipment to sow chaos in the foes' ranks. 25 DP. Delta read them aloud and Billy just stared. She eyed the options, and the words teasing her like a temptress of the night. Random pet. Random pet. She felt the itch to pick it, but she looked at Billy. Well, she asked with a smile, but the tone was a little nervous. She cleared her throat and waited. Billy looked down for a moment. Stalker, I want to be a stalker, he admitted and dealt her for relief. Random picks had been uh, interesting for her heart, and it would be good to have a stable choice for once. Hold on to your hat, Delta cheered, and hit the option. The light swirled again, and the orange was much darker this time. It didn't shatter like before, but instead flaked away like the autumn leaves. Billy looked cute with his little green hat and arrows. Now, Billy looked like a nightmare that lived in the darkness of trees. A dark hood barely showed two red eyes. The two shadows hid most of his face. The thin mouth was licked by the black tongue. The two large thin ears pierced through the hood and both were pierced with two iron rings. The form of the hunched over it was ready to launch into a sudden burst of speed. Cool arrows of dark metal filled his quiver. 
and the dark bow made from some odd wood was the tight string. The hands that held it was dark nails, showing the power that could fire an arrow at unseen distances. Billy stood straight and Delta squeaked at how he almost reached the same level as a chin. Lanky, but so tall. Billy pulled back the hood and the skin darker shade of green than before. The face, now fully shown, was almost the same as Billy's previous form, but it was more angular. It made the smile wider. This is nice, Billy stated. His voice was much deeper. Delta laughed nervously and almost wished that she had convinced Billy to spin the random wheel. Billy ran a hand over a series of pouches and items on his body. Rope, vials, folded nets, Billy was decked out for war. How do you feel? Delta asked meekly, and Billy pulled out a wicked dagger. He began to flip and catch it as he was done so all his life. I feel like I've made the right choice. Mother, I thank you. Billy bowed and pulled the hood over his head, and Delta stopped closer and looked him over. You look scary. She had let him know Billy laughed. Even better. Excuse me, I need to go test this body. I want to scare the ever-loving crap out of Swa. Billy grinned, his expression enough to give small children nightmares. How did the excitable numb become serene while the calm Billy became creepy? They were her gobs and like any good parent, she would support them in any phase that they went through, but it didn't mean that she had to be calm about it. H have fun! Delta waved and Billy stalked off. It took her a moment to notice that Billy had escaped before she could even check his menu. He was only going down the hall, but Delta needed a moment to her swerve. I swear, if I evolve Mr. Mushy and he turns into something like Maestro, I will scream, she muttered to herself, and then she paused. If I evolve the Pygmies, will they still be cute, she whispered. She was starting to have a minor panic attack when suddenly a loud arguing filled her head. People had come into a dungeon, and two of them were screaming at each other. She was at the entrance in a blink. You are a dog of the kingdom that grows fat off enslaved creatures. Holly Dabagas snapped, her usual cheery face white with anger, a man Delta had never seen before, turning redder than was healthy. They're hardly innocent. Monster attacks, manner infections, and fluctuations. Draw people in with treasures and eat them. Yes, innocent. The man drawled with sarcasm. Holly narrowed her eyes and the necklace round her neck glow green. Quiz strode in between them. Holly, calm down before I send you home. Noland, shut the hell up, he said bluntly and they both looked at him. Quiz, he's here to size Delta up for the rest of the world. This is the beginning of it all. Dabagar snapped and then took a deep breath. She looked around the entrance hall and read the sign. Suddenly, she looked sad. Please. Delta doesn't deserve this. She looked at Quiz. The man met her eyes for a long time. Dabagas looked at the peacekeeper, badge on his chest. Of course, you have no choice. She nodded and Nolan just sniffed and looked around. I must say, I'm not impre- He was cut off as he was knocked out of the way as Dio tripped into the dungeon with a yelp. Dio, sweetie, please be careful. A beautiful voice called. Delta had to clear away the slight fog of a moment as the woman's voice bounced along the dungeon walls. Delta stared at the party that had just come to her dungeon. It was a weird one. A fire mage, a druid Dio, Dio's mother, and some jerk. Welcome to my dungeon. Delta tried to sound confident. All of them seemed to feel something as Delta spoke. Dio waved. Hi, Delta, I've come to do my homework. He called and Delta had a feeling it wouldn't be quite so simple. End of chapter. That, my friends, concludes this episode. I hope that you enjoyed. If you wish to support the author of the story, there will be a link below. If you wish to support this channel, there are multiple ways to do so, which will all also be linked below. But the easiest way would be to subscribe and share my videos as much as possible. And until next time, I hope you all have a good one. And I'll see you all in the next video. Cheers.